Today is January 19th, 2020, and I thought I'd make a slightly different type of video today by showing some of the ways I use Google Earth to help me with my canoeing and kayaking adventures in Florida. I found that it's not only a great tool for exploring wilderness areas, but a great way to locate small waterways in very remote areas that no other map would possibly reveal. Google Earth also serves very well as a notebook for which to make notations about what you're seeing, as well as a diary with which to record your routes and experiences along the way. You can even pin photos to the areas you've explored or view other people's photos before you go. It's just an invaluable tool for traveling, regardless of whether you're navigating through some wilderness or downtown Miami. But today, I'm just going to focus on how I have recorded information that helps me as a canoeist and hunter. Now I know there's a lot of Google Earth videos out there on the internet, and I know that people who hike, bike, canoe, kayak, fly, sail, etc. are already quite familiar with how helpful it can be, but I think many people just use it as a navigational tool, and that's where its primary value is to be sure, but it is also helpful in so many other ways, and maybe some of my ideas will help you, especially if you like to explore by paddlecraft. Okay, having said all that, let's zoom in on Google Earth here and take a look at Florida. Now you'll immediately notice uh, I have a lot of notations within the state. Uh, some of these don't pertain to canoeing and hunting, but I'd guess about 99% do. Now Florida has 166 wildlife management areas. Uh, these wildlife management areas are publicly owned lands that are legal to camp, canoe, kayak, hunt, and fish in. They're owned by the citizens of Florida. They're mainly what I focused on here is I uh, did all this on Google Earth. And from here on out, I'll just refer to them as WMAs. Uh, these WMAs have borders, of course. And when I first started making the notations on Google Earth to help with my canoeing adventures, the very first thing I did was to outline the boundaries of these WMAs. So let's take a look at one here. This is the Kissimmee Chain of Lakes WMA. And uh, it's a medium-sized WMA in Central Florida. This white line is the parameters of the wildlife management area. If you go outside of that, you're either on private land or you may cross over into a, a game refuge, a national wildlife refuge, you, you know, a, a city. <laughs> you don't, well, usually these aren't right up to a city, but some of them are very close. So you wanna make sure you know that you're within the WMA. Um, you can see here that I used white to outline the parameters of the WMA, and I don't use that color for anything else after that. That's important because I found if you use white to trace the boundaries of the WMA or anything else for that matter, and then use it to trace, say, the routes you paddled or other data, it starts to get confusing. So I've tried to use different colors for different things, which helps my eyes segregate information as I look at what I've recorded in the past. And as you saw, it can get pretty congested. Even here zoomed in, there's a lot of different colors. I have the cyan, I have red, I have white, there's yellow note marks, so you, you, it's best to use different colors. And you can also use different line diameters and opacity levels uh, to help differentiate between things if you need to, and I do do that sometimes. Uh, but if you can, just use a different color for every different thing. Uh, so when I finished outlining the borders of the WMA, I put a place mark within it and uh, labeled it, and I put the label in green lettering. So here you see Kissimmee Chain of Lakes in green lettering. And again, I wouldn't use uh, green if I could avoid it for anything else. Once I'd labeled all 166 WMAs within Florida, I began to really, really zoom in on each one and search carefully for waterways that look big enough for a canoe. And let's take a look at this one up here. I was just uh, researching for a future trip. Um, these are two fairly large WMAs up in northwest Florida in the Panhandle. It's a pretty good drive from my home. I've never been here. I've, I've been to the area, but I've never hunt, hunted or canoed this area, and I'm very interested in trying it. The two are Tate's Hell and Apalachicola WMAs, and they're they they're back to back, so it really forms one giant area. And I think this is about a quarter million acres of land. So you're looking at hundreds of square miles. Uh, of land in here that you can hunt in. It's a pretty wild area. And that Tate's Hell is a, <laughs> that's an interesting name if, uh, I won't get into it now, but if you can Google it to learn how it got that name. But to summarize, uh, things didn't go real well for a guy named Tate uh, about 150 years ago. So be careful out there, folks. Um, 
So yeah, once I'd outlined and labeled all the WMAs, I began to really, really just look closely and find different waterways that were big enough for a canoe. So as an example, here in Tate's Hill, obviously I spotted this uh, river, and I would, uh, when, I, when I would find it, a uh, river or creek or a canal that you had to really zoom in to notice, I'd trace its path with a thin red line, and I'd add a note with any pertinent information. So as an example, let's just click on this one in um, Tate's Hell, and it says New River in Tate's Hell WMA, 25.3 miles of the New River running right smack dab through the center of Tate's Hell WMA. The upper section looks very thin, uh, that's thin, it's a typo. The upper section looks very thin and winding, but most of this river looks very promising. Tate's Hell is a huge and very remote WMA. So I wrote that like three years ago when I was assembling all this. And probably haven't read it, I read it yesterday when I was reviewing this area, but probably didn't go back to it again. I just quickly wrote the note out, put what I felt when I saw it. I said, you know, I'd say this looks like a very promising area, or it looks too shallow, or there's a lot of trees down, but it might be worth a try. Or, the boat ramp costs $10, it might, might be a place to avoid, but if I can get in here, it looks promising. I would just, whatever I saw, whatever my initial feelings were for having never been there is what I would put in the notations. And I'll add right now, that uh, this is definitely the most time-consuming uh, portion of making uh, applying this data to Google Earth. Um, when you find, but it's, it's it's exciting too. And when you find some small creek snaking through the forest off the upper end of some tributary to the St. Johns River, you know your imagination sort of takes over, and you begin to wonder what it looks like in there. You feel like you found something secret, and then when you actually do go there and travel up that exact creek or canal, it's pretty rewarding. And you can really find cool stuff, too, uh, by carefully studying Google Earth. And I'll use this as an example, if I can find it. Um, many of you have probably heard about this. It was widely reported in the news. And here it is, car with body. <laughs> this happened about a year ago, and a guy was on... Uh, Google Earth looking at, I guess he used to live in this region of Florida, and he was looking at this neighborhood, which is a fairly new neighborhood, and he zoomed in, and he said, gee, that sure looks like a car in the bottom of that lake right there. And so he contacted a man who lived in this neighborhood, and the man went out there, and I can't remember exactly, I don't think he could see anything, but he notified authorities, they came out, and pulled a car out of this lake that had a body in it of a man who had been missing for 22 years. So, and this guy found it on Google Earth just by, uh, you know, looking at his old neighborhood, the area he used to live. So who knows what you'll find. I, I sometimes zoom in on areas I used to camp at as a kid in Oregon when I was growing up, and I I have found the exact campsites on the Clackamas River and stuff. You know, I'm, I'm like, I remember sitting on that big rock right there. That's crazy, you know, but... The, the more uh, recent photographs on Google Earth are very, very uh, exact, and you can really zoom in and get quite a bit of definition in the photos. So in that case, the guy was able to see a car, and the guy, he was coming home from a bar, and he went into the lake somehow, and for 22 years, his friends and family had no idea what happened to him. Now, the story, the police aren't idiots. They know that when someone is driving from point A to point B, and they don't show up, and they don't find a car, and he didn't have any enemies, they... He probably went off a bridge or something and went into the water. But there's a lot of water in Florida. And he took some different route home and confounded them and wound up dead in the bottom of that lake and sat there for nearly a quarter century. So just keep in mind, as you're doing all this, you will find some really cool stuff that many other people, most other people, would never notice. And you'll go there and you'll see it and you'll be like, wow, look at that giant tree or whatever it is that you noticed on Google Earth. And here you are paddling up that remote creek and you find the giant tree. So, uh... That's kind of cool. I just got the hiccups in the middle of making that video, so I had to, <laughs> I had to stop and uh, make a part two here. I'll edit this in. Hopefully, uh, it will look all right. But I um, never have gotten the hiccups in the middle of making a video. So anyway, uh, moving right along, all the rivers in Florida I highlighted with a thick yellow line, but I set the opacity at like 30 or 40 percent so you can see through it. And I, I didn't trace the 
exact course of the river. I just did it roughly, but it's so, at a quick glance, I can see where the major rivers of Florida are. And in fact, this one right here that I just happened to be on, oh, and then I put a place mark in, I put it in orange, so I don't use orange for anything else. And I don't use a 30% opacity thick yellow line for anything else. And this helps, this is important. It really helps your eyes when you're looking for something quickly. Um, and this river right here, this is the Caloosahashee that leads from Lake Okeechobee, which is the fourth largest lake in the United States, um, out to the Gulf of Mexico. And I was just reading a book on the most awful, god-awful, bloody struggle America ever went through that no one ever heard of. And uh, it was called the Second Seminole Indian War. And if you want to read about a terrible, terrible war that, like I said, uh, it amazes me that Hollywood has never grabbed onto this because it was just... It was the War of the Canoe, and it was fought in jungles, hand-to-hand, -hand, brutal fighting, and it was the most costly of all America's Indian Wars. When people think of Indian Wars, they think of, you know, the Great Plains and all that, and Custer and Little Bighorn. They were not a pimple on the backside of the first, second, and third Seminole Indian Wars. And an interesting thing, too, about the Seminole Indian Wars is they're the only Indians that never surrendered that fought the U.S. and never surrendered. And you may say, well, what happened to them? <laughs> Nothing happened to them. They're still out there. They're right down here in an area called the Everglades. They're still there to this day. Now they're running casinos and, and own the Hard Rock Cafes, but the Seminole Indians never surrendered, and their descendants are still with us in Florida to this day. Uh, very, uh, very noble tribute to the Seminole. Uh, you can listen to Seminole Wind. I forget, forget the guy it's... I can't believe I forgot the singer who does that song, but it's a beautiful song about that region. So the Caloosahatchee is also a river I've never canoed, but uh, as you see, I highlighted it with a thick uh, translucent yellow line, and I have that all through Florida. All of these are various rivers labeled with a orange marker. And in the future, hopefully, I'll be able to paddle them all, but I know I will go to my grave and probably not have paddled half the rivers in Florida. There's just that much to see and do. Um, oh, once, this is important, once I've actually paddled an area, let's go up here to an area uh, that I go to a lot. Um, this is the Three Forks Marsh, the Thomas O'Lawton Lake, but no one calls that, everyone calls it Three Forks. Once I've uh, actually paddled some creek, canal, or river uh, that I've outlined in red, I come home and I trace the exact course in the color cyan, which is this uh, bluish green color here. And I leave a detailed note about the experience, which serves as a sort of journal or diary to review in years to come. So, uh, like, we'll click on this one right here and just see what I said. Uh, Three Forks, Moorhead Hunting, uh, September 26, 2018. An 8.1-mile trip into Lawton Lake at Three Forks to hunt moorhens on 926.18. Shot 15 by 2. This, a lot of typos, probably. Uh, this was my fifth expedition to Three Forks, Lawton Lake in the past 15 days. Explored west side a bit. After accidentally missing the turn to the north, uh, began paddling at 710, finished at 5. Back was hurting from straining a few days ago. Had an airboat pass me with tourists on it uh, while I was all cammied up. Saw Clayton, who I met several weeks ago at Sweetwater Canal, at the boat ramp when I returned. Great day, except for back hurting. Came home and ate four more hens that had been alive when the day started. So I just use that kind of as my diary. And I can go back and click on any of these and see uh, what I did that day. These are the trips I've made up into Lake Helen Blazes uh, and all sorts of trips I've made in the upper St. John's River Marsh. I live over here on the Barrier Island, so um, there's a lot. I've done a lot of paddling over here, just in the canals surrounding my home. Um, so, finally, if there's any other areas that I wanted to note that weren't WMAs, such as a National Wildlife Refuge or a State Park, I'd go through the same process, but I'd use a different color. Um, in fact, I did that here with the Everglades National Park. This is one of the largest national parks in the U.S., and uh, I traced it in pink. Now, national parks and state parks here in Florida are funny. You know, some of them you can hunt, some of them you can't. They're there are definitely areas that are great for canoeing and kayaking, but since I mainly use the canoe as a tool to hunt from, I I didn't I did not highlight half of the 
state and national parks in Florida just because they're places that I probably won't go to. I, I tend to stay with the WMAs, the wildlife management areas. I also label a great number of boat ramps across the state. If they were free, public boat ramps are very inexpensive. Now, um, this area over here in southwest Florida is a very ritzy area. It's all millionaires <laughs> that live out here. So the boat ramps, you see five, ten, four dollars uh, even $11, but usually if they were over like 10 bucks, I wouldn't even put them down. And most of the boat ramps in the area I live are all uh, free boat ramps and you don't have to pay. Some of them even have canoe launches. Um, you don't have to pay a penny to use them. So, uh, but I thought that would be helpful in the future. If I ever do get down to Southwest Florida and want to go canoeing, I've already spent the time to research and I know where there's a bunch of boat ramps and a lot of those I found just by zooming in you know just by going oh there's a boat ramp right there or something and uh, others I would find in some brochure there's a there's actually a website on Florida that lists all the public boat ramps but um, I put them on there even though the vast majority I'll never need or use now these uh, these orange uh, lines you see going out are just different areas that uh, were interesting areas that I thought I might hunt in the future for one reason or another. So I would put notes and you can, you know, I could click on it and read the note and why I thought it was an interesting area, but I won't get into that too much. But it, it also, using the lines like this kind of helps it from getting too cluttered. Uh, it was getting to where notations were on top of other notations. The further you zoom in, the more, um, you know, it spreads them out, but it was still getting pretty congested. And then one last thing. Um, this just reminded me of this, seeing this uh, pig encounter, deer encounter. Whenever I see a wild pig or I see a deer, even if I'm driving down the road uh, and I see a deer on the side of the highway at night, I'll go home and I'll, I'll plot it here on Google Earth. And after years of hunting and fishing, I have quite a few places that I've seen deer and pigs. And it gives me an idea of where they're at. And usually I'll remember, I saw oh, that was that one I saw while I was hunting wild pigs and it was in the daytime or it was driving down the highway and it was at the nighttime, I'll have an idea of when they're traveling through certain areas, what time of year it was and so forth. And again, I use different colors. So for pig encounters, I used like the cyan color. And for the deer encounters, I used uh, whatever this is, a purple color. But um, there's not that many of them on there and they're a small notation, so it doesn't really interfere with the other colors. But it's a good place mark to have if you're a hunter. Um, so there you have it. I'm sure I'm forgetting some things, but uh, having all this data plot on Google Earth has really helped me in several ways. First, it serves as a quick reference uh, to any public WMA I may visit in the future. And I would probably go ahead and review the area anyway before I went, but having all this definitely speeds things up, saves me some time. The second thing it does is it really teaches me a lot about the state and the places a canoe could possibly go. So if you have any ideas that have worked for you on Google Earth, please put them in the comments below and uh, we can all benefit from that. This is just the system I've developed and it's by no means the best way. I'm always looking for better ideas. It's just what I use. So I hope you all enjoyed this and I'll see you soon.